Hey everybody, my name is Craig Zappo. I am the curator of Big Cats here at the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C. I'm really pleased and feel privileged to talk to you guys today about a new minority group that was started just earlier this year called the Association of Minority Zoo and Aquarium Professionals, or AMZAP, because everything needs an acronym these days. So AMZAP, um, just wanted to talk to you guys about what we're about, why we exist, what we're doing, and what we're hoping to do in the future. The mission of AMZAP is, is really simple. We felt feel that there's a dearth of minorities in the zoo and aquarium field. I think most people will recognize that. Uh, as minorities in the field, we want to get to know each other. We wanted to get a chance to know who's who and what kind of cool stuff minorities are doing throughout the zoo and aquarium field. And as well as that, we want to hopefully see an increase in the representation of minorities through all disciplines out throughout zoos and aquariums and wildlife, exotic wildlife facilities. So uh, without further ado, we'll get into it. Kind of wanted to just talk to you guys about how AMZAP started. What what brought this all about? Well, I've, I'm, I'm a black man uh, living in Washington, D.C. I've been working in Washington, D.C. since the mid 90s. Uh, I've been at the National Zoo for 27 years, just about, um, and I, I have certainly noticed the, the lack of minorities in the field, as I'm sure most of you have. So when you're someone who kind of sticks out like a sore thumb when you're doing things like going to conferences and things like that, um, you, you almost get used to it, but you still recognize that you are one of only a few, if you're lucky, uh, people who look like you or who sound like you at that conference or in that group of people. Um, and sometimes it makes you feel uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes you, you just have this longing to, to be around somebody who looks or sounds like you. Uh, you know, and then sometimes you just live with it. And so I lived with it for several years, for many, many years. Um, it wasn't until I was at the Felid Tag Conference in 2018 uh, you know, that I was watching at the zoo day, I, w I went out to watch the lions because we had sent a lion out to the Fresno Zoo. And uh, I went to go and watch lions at the zoo day. And this young man comes out and he comes bounding out and he's, he's a black man. And he comes out and, I, and he's wearing a zoo uniform. And I thought, oh man, they let their volunteers train the cats. And uh, then I caught myself immediately having this unconscious bias that I think a lot of us have, you know, uh, if we're honest with ourselves. And I thought, man, Craig, you just did exactly what you hate when volunteer, when people who visit the zoo uh, come and think of you. Uh, you just assumed that this black man coming out here had to be a volunteer. And I was actually quite embarrassed about my thought, my own thoughts. Um, after that, you know, Nathaniel, the young man that I saw come out, went out and he trained the lion just like any zookeeper would. Um, and I, I pulled him aside after that. And I, I, as soon as I pulled him aside, he just looked at me and he said, I know where this is going. And, uh, and we chatted for a little bit. We chatted for at least 45 minutes to an hour about um, how we both feel as, uh, as black men who work in this field. And, and it, it was refreshing. And it was just, it was something that I found that I had needed for a long, long time. Um, so at that 2018 conference, I just I spent pretty much the rest of the conference thinking about how we could get our people of color who work in this field, especially like here's a black guy in Fresno who works with big cats. I'm a black guy in D.C. who works with big cats. There have to be more somewhere in between there. And wouldn't it be nice if we knew each other? And so I started scribbling notes on my notepad and, um, and I, I, I kind of came up with the fraternity of black zookeepers. Wouldn't it be cool if we had just this group of black zookeepers who could know each other and get along? And, uh, and then I started thinking, well, wait a minute, because one of the young men that I grew up with in this field, uh, a man named Juan Rodriguez, uh, is a Puerto Rican man. And he was hired not too long after me at the zoo here in DC. And, uh, and I thought, I can't 
have the fraternity of black zookeepers and just forget about my buddy Juan because the Hispanic contingent is also uh, lacking here in, in zoos and aquariums. And so I thought, well, what if what if we just extended that word black and evolved it to minorities? And we had this fraternity of minority zookeepers. And then we had to evolve again because we started thinking, well, wait a minute. If if we're if we're gonna go with partly the idea of attracting more minorities to come into the field, zookeeping isn't it. As you guys very well know, zookeeping is a is one of the cogs in the wheel of running the zoo. Yeah, zookeeping is probably one of the most popular professions that that right along with veterinary medicine. But there's so much more that goes into making the zoo run. So we thought, why not extend that? To minority zoo professionals because that encompasses all of the researchers all of the education folks you know everybody who helps make this these zoo and aquarium machines run the way that we run so the main point here is just that you know in a short time we evolved uh, our name and and our our focus uh and, and this was all still while we were in the thought processes of it of how to go about doing this so we kept going and um, as you guys probably are very familiar with you get busy and things you know, you're we're managing animals we're managing the zoos you know as we go along and and aquariums so we we didn't have a whole lot of time until last year uh, last year and we never want to make light of, of anything like a pandemic a global pandemic that, that was going on but when the zoo closed down uh, we all still had to be at work and the jobs that would normally take us the full eight hours without our visitors here were taking us five, six hours. And then we had time. So I found that I had some time to devote to trying to make this thing run. So we took advantage of that. That plus all of the issues that were going on here in the States uh, in 2020 uh, surrounding uh, the murder of George Floyd and the social unrest that went on there and race issues were really coming to a head, uh, combined with the fact that the Smithsonian itself uh, had just taken on, had just hired uh, a black man as the, the secretary of the Smithsonian. And the secretary of the Smithsonian, for those who aren't familiar with how the Smithsonian runs, the secretary is the big dog. He's the head of, he oversees all of the Smithsonian museums, he or she does. And so uh, having a black man in that position and then his deputy secretary is an Asian woman, uh, an Asian American woman. So two minorities in charge of the whole Smithsonian, plus all of the social issues, bringing light to a lot of, of or bringing focus to a lot of racial issues throughout the country, just made it all that much more important for us to uh, really take advantage of the timing to to call out an issue that's near and dear to us, you know, zoo, zoo and aquarium professionals. So what do we do from there? You know, everything's going on, but this was all, remember, just an idea in my head. And the gentleman there with the panda in his hands is, is the gentleman I was mentioning to you earlier. That's Juan Rodriguez. Um, he and I talked about it quite a bit. And, um, and then we said, okay, we know there are a few minorities here around the National Zoo, but I don't know if they're really even going to think this is an issue worth taking on. Is this a thing that people are interested in? So I literally decided, hey, I'm going to go door to door through the houses at, at the zoo. Uh, and when I say breaking all of the rules, um, I did what, what we're not supposed to do. I profiled people. And I said, hey, I know that you're not white. <laughs> you're, uh, you're something. And I didn't want to offend anybody by calling out their ethnicity because it's so hard to tell uh, just visually who is of what ethnicity. So I went to people and I asked them, are you of uh, some sort of racial or ethnic minority? And people were really eager to tell me what their ethnicity was. So I was really pleased by that. So this handful of people who you see here uh, and I decided, you know, it, it is worthwhile. We have a, uh, a, a Filipino woman. Um, we have a, an Indian man, myself. 
Juan Rodriguez, who I told you is a Puerto Rican man. We have a Colombian woman. Uh, we have a Native American woman. Uh, we have a um, Middle Eastern man. And then we have, yes, we do have white members. And we had a white woman who was very interested in helping us out. And how can I help you? Uh, so Katie is the one who uh, we asked to help us run our website. And so, uh, and I'll get to the, our white members as we go along a little further, but this handful of minorities decided we wanted, did want to try something out. How are we going to make something happen here? So we decided we were going to be the steering committee and we were going to put a call out to all of our, our colleagues here within the Smithsonian's National Zoo and see who's interested in being a part of this group if we were to start it. And we decided to start it locally at the National Zoo first, just to see what kind of membership we could drum up, what kind of interest we could drum up in a group like this. So the steering committee and I decided we were formed at that point. We sent out letters, emails to all of our colleagues out here trying to get support, and we ended up getting support from several members, or several people, around the neighborhood of 14 or 15 people were significantly interested in this group and what we were trying to do. So then it became real, you know, what are we, how, how are we going to move this forward? So we decided we were going to, uh, that's when we came up with our mission, what we really wanted to do, um, because we decided that what we really need to do is be focused. We need to make sure we're trying to put together a product. Yes, it is valid to say, hey, we all kind of crave this camaraderie that you get when you're around people who look and sound like you. That's valid. But what do you do after that? You know, do you just sit around and say, yeah, here we are, we're a bunch of minorities kicking it at the zoo? Uh, that's okay, but does that get another goal accomplished or does it get goals accomplished? So we did, that's when we decided we'd really like to see more representation. We'd like to see more of us throughout all the disciplines. And that's when we came up with that, that mission of, of increasing minority representation throughout the disciplines of zoos, aquariums, and exotic animal facilities. And how do we get there then? So that's when we decided to have our 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 goals, our, our bullet pointed goals, networking, outreach, and mentorship. Um, in mentorship, including professional development. So uh, we thought that those were really good building blocks to move toward that mission that we were trying to achieve. So then we had to approach our leadership. We approached the National Zoo's leadership first. Approaching the National Zoo's leadership or approaching your leadership at all is a little scary and it's daunting. But if you've ever tried to pitch something, to pitch an idea, you will have heard of elevator speeches and that you need to be concise. Directors, deputy directors, executives at any level, they're busy as well. They're, they're super busy. They need to know that what you're coming to them with is something that's pointed and focused and you have a plan on how to get there. So we spent months developing this plan. Uh, when we started, when I started that door-to-door -door knocking and going around and asking people what, if they were willing to share their, their ethnic heritage with me, that was around January of 2020. Um, and so when, when we got around to approaching the leadership, we were in August of 2020. So it took us several months to get to the point that we were ready to move forward. And, and fortunately, one of our biggest advocates was our then deputy director at the zoo. And our deputy director was very, very uh, appreciative of what we were trying to do. Uh, our deputy director at that time uh, was, a, was a white woman. And um, she was very, very supportive and pushed us along. Do it, do it, go for this. I'll get you a meeting with our, with our um, director, she says, with the whole director's team. And she did, she got us a meeting with the director's team and that was solely because she believed in the, the plan that we had put forward on how to move AMZAP forward, what we were going to plan to do. So I knew at that point we needed to go to our senior leadership with very specific asks. We went to them with the ask of, we wanted to start a new apprenticeship program. We got approval to do that. They agreed. Uh, that was an easy one. We wanted to put together a video presentation for an upcoming fall event that we were going to have, a virtual event, because remembering that COVID had just started. We got approval to do that. Then I wanted to get uh, the zoo to allow us to put our minority faces and our stories 
on our National Zoo website. And that's where we hit a stumbling block. We hit the stumbling block because hmm, our folks who run our website were not too sure about you know, putting a spot spotlight directly on our minority zoo professionals. And this isn't because they were they're somehow you know, racist or anything like that. It's just they were not sure about the politics of it all. I partly understand that. Of course, in hindsight, it's easier to understand. But at the time, it made me a little bit angry. Um, but now I appreciate that they did that because when I went home, I got mad and I stomped around a little bit and I told my wife, I'm so mad they won't put our, our photos on the website. And I said, you know what I ought to do? I ought to, I ought to buy a website. And um, my wife looked at me and said, okay, buy a website. And I said, okay. So I looked into it, found out how much it costs to buy a website, and I bought the website. Uh, problem was, I'm an old dude. I don't know how to run a website. And so that's enter Katie. Uh, Katie's one of the keepers who works for me. And I, on a whim, I just, I just happened to be, we were in a morning meeting one morning. And uh, after we were done talking about cats and what we were doing for, for the day, how we were going to go about the day, uh, one day I said to her, Katie, you're a millennial. You know how to work computers. I don't know how to work computers. I could barely get this thing to record today. But uh, I said, do you want to run a website? And she said, I have no idea how to run a website. I said, well, you're 20-something. You could probably do a lot better than I can. And I had mind-dumped all this information to her, including all of the, the uh, technical stuff about the website. I just forwarded her those emails. She came back to me about two days later, and she had a full skeleton of a website built up. So she did a ph phenomenal job of doing all of that. And that's how she kind of, by default, became our, our web person. Uh, and that was pretty great. Pretty, pretty great. Um, so then we built this website. We had all this content on the website that we spent a few months uh, putting together. Then I had to make sure that I wasn't going to get fired for doing that. You know, because as much as I love my people, as much as I love my community, I do not want to lose my job because I went and started a website that the Smithsonian was going to be mad about. So I contacted the Smithsonian legal team, uh, which was another scary task. Uh, you know, contacting our legal department, the Smithsonian's a big machine. So contacting the legal department, I felt like I was immediately going to get shut down. Uh, but I, I had to do it. I had to ask them for permission if I was doing things the right way. Our legal team really surprised me, um, and they were behind our effort 100%. Uh, they gave me some pointers of some language that I might want to use, some things I might want to tweak. Uh, but they looked and they said, Craig, this really fits right along with your job description. Your job description includes education and outreach, and that's what this is, professional development, education, and outreach. And that's how they viewed it. Um, so they said, there is no reason you can't do this uh, as long as you are not speaking for the Smithsonian. And so that was fine. And they even went so far as to say, you can even be shown, as you see in the photos there, with the Smithsonian logo uh, while you're at work, as long as you are not speaking for the Smithsonian. And that was great. Um, so I, I tell you that whole story just to tell you that up the chain, as I went up and up the chain, I was finding people more and more uh, encouraging about what we were doing, wanting to help, wanting to help push this thing forward. To the point that I ended up getting a meeting with the secretary, with Secretary Bunch. Uh, and talk about scary. When talking to our director was scary enough. Talking to our legal team was scary enough. Talking to the big dog is scary. And I thought, oh, if Secretary Bunch does not like this, it's going to be curtains. At that point, we had decided we're going to take this to AZA. We're going to take this and put this out there to the bigger community. But I really want the Secretary to know we're doing this so that he doesn't get slapped upside the head with, uh, hey, what are your folks at the zoo doing starting this group and he and having him not know anything about it. So I got the meeting with the secretary uh, and that was on my calendar. At the same time, I had to make sure that I was being respectful of our director because I wanted our director to know that I was going to talk to the secretary. I also wanted our director to know that the steering committee had been talking and talking and talking and we had decided that we were going to take this thing and put it out there to the bigger zoo and aquarium community. And one thing that we decided along that route 
as well is that we were going to try to drum up the support of all these zoo and, and aquarium uh, in uh, excuse me zoo and aquarium uh, facilities to be support organizations to really get behind us and, and give us some level of clout so when we did that we said uh, to our director we're gonna this is our plan we're gonna do this can we use the smithsonian sunburst and he said he wasn't quite sure about that he wasn't quite sure that he wanted to use utilize the smithsonian sunburst um, um, we decided that we we were going to tell him about the meeting with the director or excuse me with the secretary and if he wanted to let us use the sunburst please let us know before we go public we had our meeting with the with the secretary secretary bunch loved the idea he thought it was great he thought it was something that was desperately needed within the whole museum community much less the zoo community and he was behind it 100 percent right before we sent this out to AZA and the rest of our zoo community, we got permission to put to utilize the Smithsonian Sunburst. And that's a big deal. And I, I tell you guys that whole story because if there's ever a an idea that you have uh, to start a group that, that or something like this, going through your leadership is scary, but it's doable. A uh, couple things you have to remember. You definitely have to remember that your institution is a brand. Your zoo, your aquarium, your facility is a brand. And people do not want their brand to look bad. Um, but if you, in your heart of hearts, really know that your effort is something you wanna push forward, and it's good for the brand, it's good for the community as a whole, um, keep going and keep trying and be willing to make mistakes. One thing that uh, Dr. Bunch said to me was I'm really glad that you did not sit around and wait for institutional approval to do all of this because you never would have gotten it. And not because the institution doesn't want to support anything, but because it would have gotten hung up in red tape. So much like getting our, our images put onto our zoo website, we could have just stopped there and said, that's it, we're done. Guess we're not gonna move forward. But he was pleased that we went the extra mile to not just put together our own website, but to do it the right way, to check with our legal team, to make sure that we weren't stepping in any potholes, to make sure that we weren't going to make the sunburst, the Smithsonian logo, look bad. That in fact, we were going to, to hopefully make the Smithsonian logo look good. So we did all of that, and then we ultimately got permission from our director to utilize the sunburst. So that's when the Smithsonian became our first uh, support organization, and we launched we put this thing out there to the greater zoo community. So after we launched and, and put it out there to the greater zoo community, this is what we've ultimately come up with. Um, in, in between that time, right when we launched, we, we had a, an epiphany because we, we at first were the Association of Minority Zoo Professionals. I work in a zoo. I do not discount working in an aquarium. Working in an aquarium is equally as difficult as working in a zoo and for minorities it's possibly even more difficult because the dearth of minorities is even greater in the in the aquarium community um, but we never intended to leave out our aquarium friends we just didn't know we didn't even realize that we were doing it so speaking of evolving at the beginning of this we talked about evolving names and we had already come up with a logo and a brand with the AM, ANZP at that time, Association of Minority Zoo and Aquarium Professionals. But we added aquarium because we definitely did not want to leave off our aquarium friends. We didn't even want to give the vibe that we were leaving off our aquarium friends. And that worked wonders because what we found was, holy cow, we're a group of minorities who's who has not been represented ourselves very well. And here we are almost not representing a major piece of our industry in aquariums. So we, we often have to rethink our, 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 our initial um, thought processes in order to make something happen that's wholly inclusive. So what we ended up coming up with is that we, we were, I wasn't sure exactly how this was gonna be received. And, um, and when we, we sent it out, we got a lot of nice notes back that, oh, this is a good idea, this is a good idea. And we started to all of a sudden get, um, 
membership requests coming in. And uh, all we had done was created social media accounts at this point, social media accounts. And I sent direct emails to a bunch of my friends who work in the, in the, in the um, zoo and aquarium industries, mainly people who are attached to the feedlet tag because all of my career has been spent with cats, working with cats and, and involved with the feedlet tag. So these are the people who I connected with and, um, and we started getting members rolling in by word of mouth. And, um, and where we are now is sitting at, you know, almost 300 members. Uh, we're really pleased with that. Um, uh, 63 affiliates, um, uh, uh, affiliate members, and we'll talk about affiliate memberships uh, in just a few minutes. Um, and then 78 support organizations. And that, that really makes me happy when I look at that because what that says to me is that these institutions, uh, again, who are extremely protective of their brands, have a huge amount of faith in what the AMZAP mission is. They want to also see representation of minorities throughout zoos and aquariums. And that means a lot because once you have large organizations, small organizations, any institutions who work in your field behind you, it, it suddenly gives you validity. It suddenly makes us um, somebody who people will listen to because, man, if Disney and the Smithsonian and St. Louis Zoo and, you know, WCS are all behind us and, and the list goes on and on, Georgia Aquarium and so forth, um, then, wow. We, maybe people should listen to us, you know, uh, and so that's that's what we've tried to do, and that's the membership that we've accounted for so far. To break down for you a little bit what our membership is, um, you know, our our membership are what do we consider minorities? Basically, our minorities are our non-white U.S. citizens uh, and Canadian. Um, we do have uh, a couple members in Canada. Um, we include Canada because AZA runs through Canada, and we're not specifically you know, bound to AZA. We are, we consider any zoo or aquarium that's accredited by any of the accrediting, recognized accrediting organizations um, as being potential members or people who work in that, in those facilities as being potential members. Um, so our, our ethnic breakdown is pretty pretty telling you know um and we do have white members so a lot of people will ask us you know is there a place in Am in a group like amzap for white membership absolutely our our white members are extremely important to us the criteria for being a member of amzap a professional member is that you must work in an accredited facility that's it you know um our white members want to help they want to find ways, they want to know how they can get involved and help us push our goals forward. Uh, and that's one of the best things about working in the zoo and aquarium industry is that people are so willing to try to help an initiative like this that they, they want to see where they can fit in. And fitting in is just, just agreeing with our mission. Um, our white members have done things like offered, a, offered us seats at conferences to which they have access. Um, they've offered us memberships to groups to which they have access. Um, they've offered us just support. If you can imagine some of our zoos and aquariums do not have a single minority represent representative at their zoo. So sometimes it's the white member there who can be a connection to a person of color uh, who wants to get into the field. And so that's an extremely important thing to think about. Um, what kind of positions are our members holding? Um, the ones that have 0% beside them are ones where we have one or maybe two members, you know, uh, in those in those roles. But uh, uh, it's no surprise, most of our membership is animal care. Um, but we have quite a few in senior leadership, which speaks volumes. Uh, education makes up a good chunk of our, of our membership. And animal health, which I almost included with animal care, but, you know, um, I, I think there's enough of a distinction there. So what AMZAP is not, what, what I don't want people to get confused about is that we're not a full-on DEI group. Uh, DEI groups are extremely necessary. They're very important entities in, in most of our institutions. Um, but DEI groups are two things. They're all-inclusive. 
they're focused on the big picture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Um, that's a big, big task to take on. And it, it doesn't focus on racial minorities. It doesn't focus on LGBTQ issues. It doesn't focus on, you know, uh, people with, uh, with disabilities. What it does is it, it tries to focus on all of that and tries to create sweeping institutional change, big, big changes within the industry. Um, and, and those kinds of changes are slow. Those kinds of changes take years to happen. It takes a long time. I've been in the field for 27 years. I, I still haven't seen some of those changes take place. I'm afraid I'm gonna retire before some of those changes take place. And that's kind of how life works. With this group, the, the, with the impetus of this group, the, the start of this group, we thought maybe we can focus on, by focusing on one specific minority uh, arena, we can push to make a change faster than the DEI groups can make um, while the DEI groups are still focusing on their issues. So maybe we can be a part of DEI initiatives, but we are focused solely on race and ethnicity. That's it. We're asked quite a bit if we are going to include LGBTQ issues in our umbrella, if we're going to include disabilities under our umbrella, and so forth. We can't right now um, because what we don't want to do is lose our focus and then fail completely. By focusing solely on race, we're able to keep our, ourselves needle focused and try to move forward. What we can do is try to set the, set the model for anybody who does fit in some other minority category who feels that they do want to push to make a change for their specific community. We're for all of those communities. We, as a group, AMZAP will stand behind LGBTQ activists 100%. We will stand behind uh, people with disabilities 100%. We will stand behind anybody who has a, a some kind of identifier that makes them a minority in the field. Um, we'll stand behind you 100%. But we can't focus on that issue specifically. Um, so that's where we are there. Uh, we're also not an injustice group. Uh, most people, even people across US borders, have heard of groups like Black Lives Matter and things like that, groups that are, that are fighting, actively fighting against racism and social injustice. We're not fighting against racism. I may be one of the lucky ones, but I have not directly experienced racism. Uh, in, in relation to my field. Uh, I've never felt the oppression of racism within the, the walls of my, my work environment. Uh, I'm sure if you ask other minorities, they'll say something different. They'll say that they, they have felt it uh, before, but that's not what we're fighting against. We're fighting to have more representation of our communities, people who look and sound like us within the zoo field. When I became a, um, a hiring manager, here at the National Zoo, I started seeing applications come through. And I started seeing why we're not hiring as many minorities as I would like to see us hire. Because we're not seeing the applications come through. We're not seeing the resumes come through for minorities. When I have a position come open for a cat keeper, I get a stack of 20 to 30 resumes easily. And they're all, almost all, young white females. And so that's who we're hiring, you know, the people who apply. Uh, what I would like to say to my communities, to my specific community, is get out there. If you're interested in exotic animals, get out there and get hired. Um, you know, and what's the best way to do that? Well, we're, we're taking a, a note out of the book written by women, really, uh, in the U.S., who saw decades ago that women were not getting the representation that they so well deserved in, in fields like animal care. And women wrote this book uh, of, of how to get little girls who were going to become women into these fields. Um, and they said, let's show them. If you can see her, you can be her. And we said, that's what we need to do. We need to pull together as many of our minorities who are currently working in the zoo and aquarium industry and show our own minority communities that we're here. We're in this, this field and we're doing really cool stuff. Uh, 
and we want to be that example that that, uh, that our communities can follow if they're interested in getting into this field. So we're not an injustice group, we're a representation group. How do we go about doing it? Uh, so what are we doing? We're, I told you we have those pillars that we work off of, the networking, outreach, and mentorship, um, including uh, and professional development. Uh, networking, we, we don't pressure people into joining us. Like I said before, we we rely on word of mouth and people hear about us and they, they if they want to join us, which we hope they will, uh, we're here and we'll, we'll gladly pull you in. Um, we're focusing, like I said, on the US and Canada um, because you know the demographics in Canada seem to be very similar to the demographics in the US. Um, and we do have some Canadian zoos who are accredited by U.S. accrediting organizations like like AZA, so um, so the Toronto Zoo has jumped in on it with us, and we have a couple members in the, at the Toronto Zoo, and that's great. We have professional members, we have affiliate members. I mentioned affiliate members earlier. Affiliate members are the people who want to get into the field, uh, or who are not professionals for one reason or another. What we're finding is that a lot of people who used to be in the zoo field and want to stay connected to the zoo field want to join this group and that's great you become an affiliate member you're not a professional member which means really the biggest distinction is professional members are available to mentor people affiliate members are associated with the organization and get invited to events uh, but they are not eligible to mentor people coming in they are eligible to be mentored if they want to be mentored um, and so that's where you go and then silent members. Silent members are often, often our members who are not of minority heritage, our white members, um, who want to come in and they want to be involved, but they might not want to be listed on our website. Um, and a lot of people have said to me, a lot of our white members have said to me that they feel uncomfortable taking up a representation space that could be occupied by a minority uh, in the profession. And we greatly appreciate that and we respect that. And we really appreciate that you want to be a part of our group, but you're fully eligible to be a part of our group and be listed on our website and all of that stuff. And we're happy to list you on there. Um, but some of our white members have expressed a little bit of discomfort with being on the website and that's fine. And actually a couple of our, of our minority members have expressed a, a, a discomfort with being listed on the website and that's fine too. So a silent, a silent member is just someone who believes in the mission but doesn't really want to be terribly vocal or recognized for it and, and wants to kind of sit on the sidelines but still wants to get emails, still wants to participate in our, in our member events and things like that. You're more than welcome to. Uh, we have member meetings. We're trying to do them monthly. Um, we and we're trying to vary them up for for what the content or what the topic is on those. And then, like I said, we have a lot of social media activity. It seems to be the thing that the kids do these days <laughs> with the social media stuff. I didn't even know what Instagram really was until I, until this group started. Um, and I understand that. that only the old people like me use the Facebook, but whatever. Uh, I like it. Um, you know, one of the things that the networking has allowed us to do is several of our individual members, like uh, Gianna and Keisha, pictured here, uh, they they both work at different zoos in in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, they met through this group, and they got a chance to connect. And that that networking, that that you know, two black women getting together and getting to know each other, simply because this group existed, it. it that's kind of what it's all about. It, that's what this networking piece is all about. And they were they were gracious enough to share their story with us and how grateful they are to have met each other. The professional development piece, the professional development. We are really focused on servicing two pipelines. The two pipelines that we're focused on are the pipeline of current zoo and aquarium professionals. We want to retain our minority talent, the, the folks who work in the field already. Um, we lose far too many people in the field in general, but a large reason that we find that we're losing our minority uh, zoo and aquarium professionals is because they don't feel supported. They don't feel like they have that backing to go for the higher positions, to go for the next step. Um, we want them to have, you know, connections to people who are in positions uh, that can help them 
even if it's just the moral support of go for it, you can you can be the director like like Dr. Brian Davis of the Georgia Aquarium. Uh, you can be you know an executive, um, and so we want to really service that pipeline and offer the professional development and backing that that, uh, that pipeline needs. And then of course there's the pipeline of professionals coming into the field, those looking to enter the field. So for our professional development of current professionals, um, we want to make sure that we're having the mentor meetings, we want to make sure that you know we're offering scholarships and sponsorships and, and again like I said our white members, one of our white members is connected heavily with AZAC and uh, found that she could come up with two seats to the AZAC conference this year that's currently going on. Um, and she was able to wrangle up those two seats and offer them to AMZAP members. So that was great. Uh, we got to have people attend the conference. Uh, ABMA you know, offered us 100 memberships, um, and that was phenomenal. And, and these, are, these are things that people are, ways that people are finding to help support the current professionals in the field. We also have been able to get several of our members um, to have seats to, to give lectures at the AZA conference, at the AZAC conference, at the ICZ conference. Um, so these kinds of professional development things are huge uh, for, for groups like this and, and giving people a platform on which to speak. Outreach. Outreach is a big one. Um, how, do we, how do we get members to come in to our group? Well, like I said, if you can see her, you can be her. If you can see someone who looks and sounds like you, you can do something that you really dig, then you can be that person. Um, so we try to highlight our members on social media and really get, get them out there. And what we're finding is that people, people like it. People like to see the stories. See, reading someone's story like Kara here, um, it, it makes her real. You know, it makes her a real person. She's not just a picture on a page. Once you read her story and where she came from and how, how she got to be where she is. Uh, and if you're somebody who looks like Kara, maybe you see yourself in her. And that's kind of kind of cool. We, we dig that quite a bit. Um, we're looking for any way that we can turn the rocks and look behind the doors and find the minorities working in facilities that, 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 were, that we didn't reach on that first sweep you know, of trying to get people's attention. Not everybody reads their email religiously. Not everybody hears the same things. So we're looking for all the different ways that we can connect with people. And we're still getting people who say, I saw your, I saw your post randomly on, on social media, uh, even though we've sent emails to their leadership. So, you know, we're, we're still, we're trying to get the word out, trying to make sure people know that we exist. Uh, we're taking advantage of any spot that we can get. We were approached by the, the such media outlets as the Washington Post, which is great. You know, that's going to reach a lot of people, we hope. Podcasts, like I said, taking advantage of, of any any kind of way to get the AMZAP name out there so that people who are interested can participate. That's really what we want to do. Um, we're in the process of connecting with academic organizations, and we've gotten a few. We've gotten a few academic organizations to recognize and, and see what kind of resource AMZAP can be to their students, to their student body. What can we give you uh, to help you do your job more effectively? Um, you know, so, so we're looking really to be a resource. Um, we do talks. We've done several talks. Our members have done talks, myself and, and several of our other members have done talks at, uh, at, for uh, student groups, uh, veterinary groups, etc. And those, those have gone really, really well. Uh, one of the most notable ones that we did, we did a talk for the University of Puerto Rico. And that was really cool. Um, I, I do not speak Spanish, but uh, several of our members do, and they were able to connect with some of their, their uh, as I'm told uh, they're called. Uh, so that's kind of kind of cool. And then mentorship. You know, mentorship doesn't just mean the old people like me mentoring the young people coming in. It means the old people like me getting mentored by people who are senior to me. Uh, mentorship never stops, you know. And, and what, one thing that I'm finding that's a little bit surprising is that people are scared of the word mentorship. Uh, they hear mentorship and they say, I don't know if I'm qualified to be a mentor. Yeah, you are. You've got lived experience. You're a professional in this field. You may not be able to take someone and get them a job, but what you can do is show them through your lived experiences what, you're what they are able to achieve 
because you achieved it, you know, quite simply. You know, uh, just because you're a person from a minority community and you've never seen a minority working with lions or sea lions or anything like that, doesn't mean you can't do it. Uh, you know, so make sure that when you're thinking about how to mentor a student, you're thinking about what you have to offer and what you have as a professional in this field is quite a bit. Uh, whether it's formal training to mentor or not, you have the lived experience. Um, so uh, one of the things that makes me the most proud of this program is that, like I said, we started, we, we threw this boulder over the ledge and, and launched this thing uh, in February of 2021. And now we're in September of 2021. Um, and we've had three people who have been mentored by our by our minority mentors be hired into full-time positions, uh, Cameron, Bria, and Laura. And we're really, really proud of that. Um, not taking credit for them being hired. They take the credit for themselves being hired. Uh, but we like to think maybe our mentors gave them a little push, a little bit of a, in, of a, um, a support to move forward. Uh, you know, even if it's just helping them tweak their resumes uh, or just giving them that, yeah, you can do it, you know, kind of support, um, that helps. And it means the world to students like this. So how do you join? If you're interested, um, we hope that, that some of y'all have heard this and have gotten a little bit interested in it. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a professional, come on in, you know, just shoot us an email. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're questioning whether you qualify, send us an email. All we are are a bunch of animal keepers sitting around uh, monitoring a Gmail account. Uh, we're happy to talk to you. We're happy to chat with you about whatever. Uh, if you're an affiliate member or, or someone who works in an unaccredited facility, um, you know, talk to us. We, we're happy to try to evolve even in, in what some of our criteria mean. Uh, we're more than happy to talk to people. But just shoot us a note. Uh, the, the website, uh, I will give the information for the website at the end of this. Uh, website's super easy to get to and hopefully you'll find it easy to navigate. And lastly, I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you guys at the ICZ conference, the International Con uh, Conference of Zoo Keepers, um, because you guys represent something to us that we've been asked a couple of times. Are we, is AMZAP interested in moving to the international stage? Honestly, like I said, 2018, Fresno, California, Washington, DC, this idea was born. I didn't even know that people were gonna be mildly interested in, in this as an idea. But as I've been asked a few times, you know, from people in various countries, how can we be involved? I honestly don't know. I don't know what the needs are in other countries for something like this, you know, for a, a, a group based solely on race. You know, is there room in other countries? Is there a need in other countries for something like this? Uh, if there is, please let me know. Uh, and we can talk. I don't know that we have the bandwidth to do anything, but is it worth us regionalizing and saying, you know, hey, there is a need in, in some countries. Um, like, like we mentioned before, is there a need for a group like AMZAP for a community that AMZAP doesn't represent? Quite possibly. Um, if the group is focused and the group has, has specific goals of wanting representation or wanting equality or wanting anything like that, um, I don't know that AMZAP is the group to push those agendas forward, but can we help? We'd like to. We, we certainly would like to. I would like to see our LGBTQ brothers and sisters get what they want out of representation and equality. Uh, how can we help do that? You know, um, so I, I almost turn the tables to say, how can we help you? Um, how you can help us is by just telling us if there's a need internationally for something like this. and and whether or not we can partner with groups like WAZA or, or anybody like that. Uh, it, would be, it would be great to know. I don't know. I don't have connections from, from overseas, uh, you know, as, as much as I'd like. So let us know and, uh, and please, uh, you know, let us know how we can help. And, and we're happy to, to take this thing as far as it can possibly go and help as many people as we can possibly. 
So I really appreciate you guys taking time to listen. I know that was a, a lot of mouthful of words. Uh, I could talk for longer if, if you gave me the time to. Uh, but for now, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time, listening to what we have to say. Um, hopefully you'll be able to jump on the website, investigate Ham's app a little bit further, um, see what we're all about even more. Shoot us an email if you have ideas, you know, about how we can evolve even further, how we can make our product even better, how we can become a better resource for communities, uh, not just here in the U.S., but maybe even around the world. Please let us know. Thanks for everything. Take care, guys.